John the Baptist is your friend. Some of you might only have a vague idea of um, who John the Baptist was or his place in the Christian story. Others of you uh, will need no introduction to him. You're very familiar with this person who is there at the beginning of the New Testament. Some people in Halifax, as you talk to them, talk to them about someone called John the Baptist. I suppose some people might say, well, which particular Baptist church does he go to? Um, like they might say, you know, Gene the Methodist or Jim the Anglican, I don't know, John the Baptist. Well, I, I think he's meant to be the patron saint of Halifax, actually. You can look that up if you want. Jesus himself um, rated John the Baptist as greater than any other person who'd lived thus far in history. But however much you know or don't know about this person who lived and died 2,000 years ago, he's still your friend. Why is he your friend? Because of his message to you, which is preserved for you, preserved for me, by the Holy Spirit, in the Bible. Let me summarise it for you in a few words. Here's John's message. Make it easy every day for Jesus Christ to walk into your life. That's John the Baptist's message in a nutshell. Make it easy every day for Jesus Christ to walk into your life. Free access for Jesus. That's my kind of paraphrase, I guess, of verse 23 of John chapter 1. If you have a Bible, it would be great to have it open there on page 1063. John chapter 1, verse 23. John replies in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Here's my message. Make straight the way for the Lord. In other words, give Jesus an easy path into your life every day. Be as ready as you know how to welcome the person of Christ into every aspect of your being and experience. Let him walk there, John says. Let him talk there. Let him rule there in your life. Remove every obstacle to Jesus reigning as king in your heart and in your behaviour. That's John's message. Make straight the way for the Lord. And I'm saying to you that someone who pushes the person of Jesus so forcefully into your line of sight is your friend. Now, almost all of you here, I'm sure, will be in the happy position of having friends, at least some. Some of you have many friends. People you spend time with, people you drink tea or coffee with, people you eat your sandwiches with. People you play with in the playground if you're at school. Your friends. People you laugh with. People you cry with. And of course such relationships are a precious gift of God to each of us. Friends. But you know some friends are better than others. Do you have a friend who can spend all of that time drinking tea or coffee, going to the shops, sharing a sandwich? Do you have a friend who can spend all of the time that they have with you and never mention Jesus. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have a friend who will never, and I don't mean this, that they do it in a, a, a knowing or a deliberate or even a malicious way, far from it. But if you have a friend who never once brings the Lord Jesus Christ into your line of sight, well, that person may certainly mean well. I may be a good friend in many respects, and there's plenty that you can be thankful for in knowing them, but ultimately, their friendship has not yet gone beyond baby steps. That is a friendship. There might be a genuine friendship, but really it's still in nappies. A proper grown-up friend is the person who reminds you often of the friend of sinners. A person who will talk about Jesus to you. Who will encourage you to look to him. He will say, why don't we finish this cup of tea or coffee by speaking to our friend, the Lord Jesus. Why don't we just read a verse 
of the Bible about him. That is a, that's a friend. Someone who will bring Jesus into your sight. And if you don't have many friends like that, well, I trust and pray that over time you will gain some more, or maybe you can take the step of being a friend like that to someone else and introduce your saviour more and more to a Christian friend, to a non-Christian friend, and be that kind of friend to others. But you could also do a lot worse and spend a bit of time in the company of John the Baptist. He is our friend in at least three ways that I want to point out to you from this passage. And the first way in which he is your friend is this. He is clear that he is not Jesus. John the Baptist is your friend because he is clear that he is not Jesus. If you look at verses 19 and 20 of John chapter 1, we read this. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Now John had been causing a bit of a stir at this time in uh, the region where he was. He was making a huge impact upon many people's lives. At that time, he was a powerful preacher. He was a magnetic personality. Many people followed him and sat at his feet listening to his teaching. Whole communities were being transformed by his presence near their town or city. People asked him for his opinion on how they should live their lives. He was their guru, John the Baptist. They went to him. What should we do? How should I behave? What, what life pleases God? And he attracted a, a huge following. And uh, decades later, decades after the death of John the Baptist, if you read two-thirds of the way through the book of Acts, you will find people who are still disciples of John the Baptist. That's how they identify themselves. 600 miles away from the Jordan River in the city of Ephesus. Okay, so he had a massive, massive impact upon not just that little place where he was baptising, but across the whole ancient world of the Mediterranean. So let's be clear, right? This person was a big deal. But he is clear that he is not the big deal. He is clear that he is not Jesus. He is not the Messiah. He did not fail to confess, verse 20, but confessed freely. He's not embarrassed about this. I am not the Messiah. He's saying, I am not the one that you really need. Yes, I'll preach, I'll teach, I'll point you to somebody else, but I am not the Saviour. I am not, he says, as, as many Jews were expecting, I am not the Old Testament prophet Elijah raised from the dead, which... Some of them thought would happen before the coming of the Messiah. He denies that in verse 21. Are you Elijah? I am not. He denies that he's the prophet prophesied by Moses who would come in the end days. Also in verse 21, are you the prophet? He answered, no. The testimony of John the Baptist here seems to be all about what he is not, isn't it? And that's actually really important in John's Gospel. Um, the fourth account of Jesus' life. You might remember, if you have some familiarity with the Gospels, that unlike Matthew, Mark and Luke, John's Gospel uh, has Jesus repeatedly saying, I am, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the one you're looking for. And those particular sayings, there are seven main ones in John's Gospel, they become known proverbially as the I am sayings of Jesus. But here at the outset of John's Gospel, and I think this is somewhat deliberate, we have these crucial I am not sayings. I am not the Messiah. I am not Elijah. I am not the prophet. And that makes John the Baptist your friend. Right? Because he will always be saying to you, if you think about his message to you, in this passage of scripture, he's always saying, no, no, not me, don't look at me, I'm not your Messiah, I can't save you, I can't heal you, I can't make you new, but there is someone who can. And that is the mark of a true friend. Outside of Jesus, anyone who's going to be a friend to you will say, I am not your Messiah. 
I am not the one who's going to be able to finally fix you. I can help you, I can point you in the right direction, I can give you some advice, I can be a shoulder to cry on, I can laugh with you, I can pray with you, I can sing with you, but I cannot save you. That's a true friend. A true friend knows that they are not the solution to your deepest problems, there's only one person who's that. I remember myself very early on in, in pastoral ministry, whether I was, in, in, when I was an assistant pastor, or I think when I just started here, I think it was, I was speaking to another pastor who, who's become a, quite a close friend now, and uh, he had a fair bit more experience than me in pastoral ministry. And he said to me, as you start out on your ministry, it's important to remember, there will come times where it all gets a bit much for you, he said. And at those times, you've got to remember this, you are not people's saviour. That is really important for a pastor to remember, because... In, in the business of running a church and preaching the gospel, seeking to counsel and help people, it's often a temptation to fall into to think that you can fix people finally, and you can't. And what's true for a pastor is true for you, and it's true for your friends. They can't fix you finally. Only Jesus can fix you. So, you are not the saviour, your friends are not the saviour, and really that ought to be a relief or it takes the pressure off us. We can't save anyone. We can't ultimately sanctify anyone. That's the work of Christ. Many times there are things in our lives which are too big for us and too big for our friends. But the good news is they are not too big for the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have something like that right now in your life, you can take it to him. If you took it to John the Baptist, John the Baptist would say, well, okay, I will point you in the right direction, but I can't fix you. But I can show you someone who, who will who's willing to, to bear with sinners, to welcome them, show grace to sinners, and help and transform. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first way in which John is your friend, which you need to understand. He is clear that he is not Jesus, and neither am I, neither are any of your friends. Thank God there is a Jesus who will help you. Okay? Second way that John the Baptist is your friend, he calls you to be ready for Jesus. He says he's not Jesus, but then he does call you to be ready for Jesus. Having heard what John was not, the inevitable question arises in the minds of the people he's speaking to in verse 22. Okay, finally they said, who are you? <laughs> Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? We've heard enough about what you negatively are not. Tell us positively what you are. What are you doing here? Who are you? John is very clear about that also. Comes to his positive answer now, verse 23. Touched on it already. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. He is a fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy all the way back in Isaiah's day, saying that one would come to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And as he quotes this from Isaiah, it's a very powerful statement in more than one way. Because, first of all, John is, in applying this to himself, John is saying um, that the person coming after him is not just another prophet or another man <coughs> like himself. Don't miss the stupendous claim that John says, make straight the way of the Lord. The Lord is on his way. Isaiah didn't mean us to understand when he prophesied that, that just a great man is coming. He didn't mean that. He meant that Yahweh is coming. The God of Sinai is coming. He is approaching. He plans to plant his feet on this way. The way that will follow after John. And that one who is coming on that way is the one who struck down the Egyptians. At the Passover and in the Red Sea that's the one who's coming the Lord is coming John is saying Isaiah is saying the one who is coming who we're to prepare for is the one who commanded Adam not to eat and then when Adam did eat threw him out of the garden that's who's coming the Lord is coming the one whose robe hem Isaiah himself glimpsed amid billows of smoke pouring out of the temple and he feared, he said, woe is me, I've seen the king. 
the Lord of hosts. That's who's coming, the Lord. The one who said he would one day reverse all the curse of Eden and be his people's God, and they will be his people forever and ever. That's who's coming. Prepare the way for that one, the Lord. Yahweh is coming. And you'll see his face. You never could before, but you'll see it. And you'll see his glory, John is saying. The Lord is coming. If you don't understand that that's who Jesus is, that's who Jesus is. The God of heaven, become a man for us and our salvation. And John the Baptist's whole ministry is crying out, he's almost here. He's so excited. The world has been waiting. The angels have been waiting for the time when, to their stupendous wonder, the God of heaven would become a human child and grow up and live and minister and die and rise again. The whole of creation has been waiting for him. And he's saying, get ready, make the way straight for him. Let him take charge. Let him walk into your life unhindered. And the way John says this, I think is, I find it very striking because it's often thought that John himself prepared the way for the Lord. You know, he got people ready for, for Jesus. And in a sense, that is true. John did prepare the way for the Lord. But if you read the text carefully, you'll see that he doesn't actually say that. He doesn't say, I'm here to prepare the way for the Lord. He says that his whole job is to call you and me to prepare the way for the Lord. Let me read it carefully to you again. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. In other words, the people who are to make sure that Jesus, the, the king, has a ready entrance, the one who's, ones who are to prepare the way for the Lord, is not actually John, but us, you and me. We must make his way straight. So John is saying, let that happen. Let the way be absolutely smooth and clear for him. Let him encounter no obstacle from you as he does so. You, you get on and make his way straight. It is Yahweh, after all. Who, who would refuse him? Will you really say no to him today? Will you really say, well, come back later, would you? <laughs> to your maker? When he says, I'll be your saviour as well? That's who Jesus is. You must be ready for him, ready for him to invade, ready for him to take control. Not to put the barriers up and say, well, hold on a minute, I'm not ready for you. You make yourself ready. I must make myself ready for him. He saves by taking control, by saying, I'll take over, I'll take your sin at the cross, I'll bear it away forever. I will resurrect you in power in my own flesh on the third day. As I unite you to myself in that awesome conquering of death. He will reign in gracious and patient love over your good days and your bad days and your really ugly days. He will reign. And he'll be gracious. He'll be kind. But you must let him. You must say, come on, please do. Walk in. Have your way with me. You must clear the way where he wants to walk. You must smash your proud roadblocks and tear down your anxious no entry signs and flatten your stubborn claims of being okay without him. It's not how it works. You make his way straight. You stop pretending that you can manage without him. You, you don't hold the door shut to him while calling out, oh, I'll be with you in a minute. And you release your grip on whatever sin is in his way and you let it be run over by the steamroller of his mercy. Flatten it. Let him flatten it. Release your grip on what hinders him coming in. And fling open the door that will let Jesus walk in whenever and wherever he likes. That is what John the Baptist is trying to get you to do. That's what I'm trying to get you to do. to get yourself ready for him. And that is the second reason John the Baptist is your friend. He calls you to be ready for Jesus. Is there something holding you back? Is there something where you say, I'm just not ready to let him take complete control and have his way in every respect in my life? Well, if that is you, right now is the time to repent 
and say sorry and say, Lord, forgive me. I've been so slow to let you in. Come in, please. Have mercy on me. What do you need to flatten so that Jesus may walk in? Ask yourself and he will be merciful to you as you seek to do that. So that's the, the second reason that John the Baptist is your friend. First reason is he's not Jesus. He's clear about that. The second reason is he calls you <clears throat> to be ready for Jesus. And the third reason is he tells you of the surpassing worth of Jesus. He tells you of the surpassing worth of Jesus. <clears throat> Let me encourage you now, as I'm sure John the Baptist would have done, that if you will welcome the Lord Jesus Christ, the maker of all things, into your life, to have his way there, then that Lord you'll find invading will never disappoint you and will never be harsh to you or hide some other purpose which is not so nice from you. He is open and honest. He says, I'm going to heal you, transform you and forgive you and I'll always just tell you how it is and I'll be good to you. That's the saviour who will come in and walk into your life. And that is the third thing that John the Baptist was utterly clear about. In verses 24 and 25, the Pharisees are still mystified. They say, okay, um, why then do you baptise if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? So John explains himself, why am I baptising? I'm baptising people as a sign that they are getting their hearts ready. This is great. They are cleansing themselves symbolically from self-dependence and pride in preparation for Jesus to replace sin as their Lord. Sin was their Lord, and whenever sin said, do this, they jumped. Yep, I'll do that. And now Jesus is taking sin's place. And Jesus now comes in and says, no way, sin, you clear off, I'm master now. I'm Lord. I'm calling the shots. And now these people, they're, they're ready then for Jesus to take his place in that way, in their lives. In other words, the baptism that John gave to people wasn't an end in itself. It wasn't like, okay, this is some special ritual and we're all going to be baptised here and this is wonderful. No, it was a preparation for the Lord coming and, and, and walking into people's lives. Baptism said, I need a better Lord than myself and I will therefore wait for him. And everyone who said that and everyone who was baptised by John as a mark of that, for them the wait would not be long. Jesus was just around the corner. Verse 26, I baptise with water, John replied, but among you, he's here, he's nearly here, he stands one you don't know, he is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. In other words, Jesus, John is saying, the way will be worth it, just, just wait and see, he's worth it. I'm telling you that this man, this, this God man that I serve, he is the one of surpassing worth. You think, You've seen something good in me. Well, you haven't begun to see good. When you come across him, you'll find a person infinitely greater than this shaggy guru with a loud voice that you see before you. No, I'm nothing, he says. You might not have recognised him yet. He stands among you. You don't know him yet. But when you do, you'll know that compared to him, I'm like an ant trying to pat a mountain on the head. The straps of his sound. Not even worthy to... Untie. You know, in those days, rabbis had pupils who would learn from them. And it, it, I, I understand in the tradition of rabbis and pupils, they, the pupils were expected to do a lot for their rabbi and serve them in different ways, around the home, and whatever. But the one thing that uh, they were not expected to do was to go to the, the point of untying the shoes of the master, of the rabbi. He could do that himself. That would be a bit degrading. Um, for the, the people to have to kneel down and actually untie the shoes of his rabbi. But John the Baptist is saying here that if Jesus did ask him to untie his sandals, he, John, would refuse, not because such a task was too low, as commonly thought, but because it was too high. I'm not worthy to even untie the man's sandals. Even the dusty footwear of the Lord Jesus Christ was holy ground for John. How could I even touch what had touched my master, he's saying. 
how could I get so close to one who spoke the stars into being? How could I do even that? I'm not worthy to untie even his sandals. I'm telling you, sister, this man is of surpassing worth. He's not just a bit like me and a tiny bit better. He's of a completely different category. He's my maker who formed me in my mother's womb. And I'm saying he's the best news you'll have ever heard. He's come for you. He's come to redeem you. He's come to say, be embraced in the Father's love. Be forgiven and pardoned by my death for you on the cross and my glorious resurrection. John is saying, I'm saying to you, if you let this man walk into your life unhindered, if you repent of all the things that might block him coming in, you'll find such kindness. You'll find such forgiveness, such love, such majesty, such goodness, that you'll hardly be able to believe that he wants to be your friend and your saviour. The distance between you is so great. He's the creator. You're a creature. And yet he wants to bridge that gap completely and walk with you and eat with you and spend every moment with you. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do. The Lord of glory wants to spend time with you. He wants to be there every day with you. If you prepare the way for him then, if you say, oh, I'm so sorry, I held the door shut for so long. If you do that, the one whom you've prepared for will never disappoint you. He is of surpassing worth. So come on, make the way straight for him. Say it to myself, say it to you. Are there things that are still in the way? Throw them out and have him instead. Let's pray to them. Oh dear Saviour, it's just astonishing, considering what we're like and what you're like, that you would even think about us, let alone want to spend every moment of every day with us, loving us, helping us, forgiving us, walking with us. But given that that is the promise which we have held out to us now by the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. We take hold of it and we say thank you and we say help us please to make the way straight for you. Thank you for John the Baptist, your friend, pointed the way to you. May we follow where he's pointing and end up with you, the one of surpassing worth. We pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen.